Top Med Talk. Nick Majerison here and welcome to Top Med Talk. This is the panel discussion which followed the address at EBPOM 2017 by Sir Bruce Keogh on the eve of the 70th anniversary of the NHS. It's a panel discussion that features Sir Bruce Keogh, our very own Professor Monty Mython, also Professor Carol Peden of Anesthesiology and Executive Director of the Centre for Health System Innovation at the University of Southampton, California and the University of Bath and the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. We also had Professor Salt Aronson there, tenured professor at Duke University, Executive Vice Chairman in the Department of Anesthesiology, and Mike Grocott, Professor of Anesthesia and Critical Care Medicine, University of Southampton, and the NIHR Senior Investigator, and Dr Ramani Munasinger, Director of the UK National Institute for Academic Anesthesia, Health Services Research Centre. All of those people on the panel all taking questions from the audience after the excellent talk that was given by Sir Bruce Keogh, which, if you click on the website, you can find in full the Ernest Henry Starling Plenary Lecture 2018. It's called 70 Years On, Our NHS. It's available in full on Top Med Talk. Have a little look for that. Anyway, before that, let's have a listen to this panel discussion. The future, in my view, is going to be determined by economics. I've already alluded to the fact no one has money. It's the number one driver of all healthcare systems in the world. The second is that people want more comprehensive and more integrated care. And the things which are going to impact on us, I think, that we need to respond to, this is about the Darwinian adaption, is to mobile technology, artificial intelligence. That's starting to come together. When you have Jeff Bezos saying he's linking up with Warren Buffett and you know, Berkshire Hathaway, and they're linking up with J.P. Morgan to bring the same kind of disruption to healthcare, we need to sit up and take notice because that's here now. And then finally, genomics and cell and gene therapy. So those, I think, are the big issues for us. And finally, Mark, if you'll uh, forgive me, Can I just say, at a time that people are going to be asking, is our NHS fit for the future? I would say with the advent of genomics, where you can start to predict at a population level who's likely to suffer from what disease, and at an individual level. We work in a healthcare system where the values that drive it say, We pool our resources, whatever those are, whatever Parliament gives us, we pool our resources and we offer the best care we can to every member of the population, irrespective of their ability to pay, their need, you know, whatever their backgrounds, whatever. There's something really fair in that. And so I find myself wondering whether now is the time we should be thinking that with the predictive ability of genomics, We aren't better equipped for the future than many other healthcare systems. And I invite you to ask whether you want to be in an insurance-based system with that kind of medicine on the horizon. Thank you. Thank you for an excellent talk. Do we have any questions from the uh, audience for our panel? (laughs) Professor Fleischer. Yeah, so I'm curious that uh, uh, you brought up Berkshire Hathaway, Amazon, and J.P. Morgan. And I've had the privilege of talking to several of the people who interviewed for that job, and many of them couldn't figure out what the plan was, which is why they didn't take the uh, position or or go further. So who's going to disrupt us? Do you think it's the 30-year-old tech startups that are going to disrupt us? Do you think it's the gray-haired gentleman... uh, uh, who are on the stage, where do you think the disruption is going to come from? What do you think? Okay, so the point is, I mean, they do have good guys. After all, Gawandi's joined them. Um, sometimes you don't know the answer to a problem before you go into it. And what we do know is that Amazon's main business is IT, that their delivery business and all of that's a secondary part of their business. So they know how to do the IT. We know Warren Buffett is, is capable of raising money and putting his money in the right place. And we know that JP Morgan also have the ability to do that. We also know that between them, those organizations have a population of about a million people. 
And we also know that Amazon's tested some of its previous technologies on its own staff. So I think, I think they're looking at kind of new ways of joining up medical records, and that's the fundamental basis of integrated care. I think they're um, also looking at ways, they're going to be looking at ways of delivering stuff, um, whatever that might be. I just think they have a track record of disruption. And that's something that we need to be alert to. If I may, I I would say um, the free market is going to be the disruptor. And I think those personalities and philosophies um, linking up together with their core competencies are going to unleash the free market's uh, forces to be the disruptor. I I think healthcare has been perversely... um, stifled um, and not be subjected to the force of the free market. And I think the free market is now going to unleash itself on healthcare. Thank you for an excellent, excellent presentation. All of them uh, were phenomenal. Um, The question, just to follow up on uh, Dr. Fleischer's question, machine learning, we talked genomics, but machine learning and AI and the folks who are now, you know, we think are going to be responsible for disruptive innovation a lot of what we're hearing is that's a drive of theirs. How do you compare what's going on uh, across the pond with them to efforts here in that regard? So from where I sit, the pond isn't a very big divide. So, you know, um, Google have a big enterprise in, in this country. Uh, a number of other organizations are interested in this. We have... Um, a whole series of startups in the um, in the old street area of this city. Um, so I, I agree with Sol that it's going to unleash a, a whole load of stuff. The, the difficulty is people talk about artificial intelligence as so kind of one thing. And of course it isn't, the whole spectrum. And we're governed by pretty strict European Union regulation, um, which means you you... These things fall under the medical devices um, regulations, which means a, the software behind them has to be um, assessed and passed through the regulations. So you can't fiddle with it um, without having to go through it again. And that puts a stifler on the kind of black box artificial intelligence. There's also another issue which people are grappling with, particularly I, I know in Korea at the moment. Um, that there are two things that are expected, uh, certainly from European legislation, is your right um, to discovery. So you you have a right to know how some artificial intelligence has made a decision. And secondly, you have the right to be forgotten. And there is a bit of a conflict there. And there's a complexity, and particularly in the black box AI, about how you regulate for that. Mm -hmm. So... Bruce, your closing comments. I, I'm not convinced it's all about the free market. I think the free market will be hugely disruptive and has a lot to offer, but if we purely leave it to the market, then uh, if you're not working for J.P. Morgan Chase or Amazon or Berkshire Hathaway, then you're in big trouble because if, if you look like an insurance risk, you're not going to get on the payroll. Yeah. So, so it has to be a free market. You know, healthcare is the classic example of market failure. We've had wonderful innovations from the free market, but within a framework which is regulated and overseen and is about, in, in this country, any about universal equality of access. And, and if we lose that, I think it would be disastrous and, and ever more disastrous as we look forward. So, fair enough. And I, it makes for good discussion and, and uh, maybe discourse. But we, we um, I, I will be a devil's advocate. I don't know that I want to own this opinion, but I'm just going to generate discussion by responding. Um, we, we see this all the time. We, we are all credit risks by the basis of our history, or um, we seek insurance to pay for our you know, risk to drive a car or buy a home or, or what have you. And, and, um, and, and, and we could you know, apply that same principle of genomics or proteomics or, or you know, our, our uh, uh, characteristics from a health risk. Um, should somebody who smokes and was asked not to get an artificial knee in front of somebody who 
decided to quit smoking? I mean, these are hard questions, and, and they really force us to, you know, go into that place where we may be uncomfortable. But I, I, would, I would submit to the discussion, we already do that. So why is healthcare different, or should be? Can I just say we had that debate? I'm sorry to interrupt. We had that debate with seatbelts. Should people who don't wear seatbelts be treated free? Anyway, in the end, um, you know, we know where we are now. Carol. I was just going to comment on the free market, and the first thing that happened to me when I moved to Los Angeles and I had innovation in my title was that I met lots of fantastic startup healthcare people. And I think it's very important, and I know this, the NHS has done this by involving young doctors in innovation, that we have to be part of the conversation. Otherwise, there is perhaps a tendency for some of these amazingly brilliant startup companies from Silicon Valley to have great ideas of health, about healthcare, but not have to have the people who really know about healthcare in the conversation. So I think that we have to learn about it, bring our ideas up, and make sure we're part of the conversation. Otherwise, there'll be some great free market ideas that are not terribly useful to us. Can I push the panel on that a bit farther? Do do you think that we are capable of internal and creative disruption in a way that we can push some of these things forward? And if we are, what does a framework look like that allows us to aggressively pursue that? I think we're we're very conservative. I think we have a tendency to protectionism of our own jobs and workforce. And I think that we have quite a lot of problem experts So in other words, you can get a group of people to put as much energy as possible into why we shouldn't do what appears to be the bond or obvious, which is going to cost some people their jobs because it's a cheaper, more efficient way of doing things. Is that familiar to you, Mark? Yes. (laughs) But how do we push the... How do we turn the dial up on that? How do we move that forward? Because we're great at talking. I mean, it's a national pastime, isn't it? That We always discuss the NHS because everyone's got an opinion. But we've got to do something practical, and whether it's the external disruption that Bruce talked about with his history professor or whether it's the, the free market, something's got to change that dial at some stage. And how do we push that and create that if we do think that's where we need to go? So I, I used to say I'm a glass half full uh, person. My daughter's a mechanical engineer taught me that's a bad analogy because it's not whether the glass is half empty or half full. It's a flaw design in the glass. Um, uh, but... Nevertheless, I think we have to address that inner demon, if you will. There is an intrinsic self-servingness to what we do and how we perhaps address that question. I love Michael Porter's commentary about how we all have to practice to the height of our abilities. And the fact is that many of us in this room are really expensive and shouldn't be doing what we do. And there's a whole dimension of extenders that needs to grow and be developed. There's a whole generation of smart people that will invent technologies and tools that will put us out of work, and that's appropriate. So I do look forward to the evolution of our abilities to address those problems, um, because I think we are fundamentally smart, and I also believe fundamentally well-intended and good. And, and, And at the end of the day, I think that's what we'll survive. And I do think the free market will push us to that. I completely agree, but I think it's got to be within a framework. And I think one of the things we should change is how we see ourselves and therefore how we train the future us. Because there's, I know medical school's changed quite a lot since I was there, but the, uh, you know we're getting into quality improvement, but innovation, economics, all those things which are fundamental to leading in healthcare, which is what all consultants do, we should be teaching and making that part of our professional identity. We just take a comment from Remini on the panel and then we'll move to Ross for another question. I completely support that and I think um, moving further on that comment about medical school education, one thing that we absolutely know is that we will be completely unable to predict the world that the doctors that are going through medical school right now will be living in when they retire. Absolutely unable to do that because we've seen that in our own working lives so far. And one of the things that we need to breed in this, in this generation of healthcare professionals coming through now is flexibility and the ability to understand that they will not have a job for life necessarily or it won't be the same job decade on decade. And they need to be flexible for that, they need to be prepared for that, they need to be resilient for that. In this country, we've had a lot of antipathy to physician extenders you know, in various parts of practice. Forget 
nurse anesthesiologists or, or whatever you want to call it, it's going to be the machine because mm -hmm. the, the technology is going to take over the traditional role, for example, of the anaesthetist and the surgeon yeah. and so on and so forth in our, I hope, lifetimes. So breeding that resilience and that flexibility in, in undergraduates that are going through now is, I think, the key thing that we have to address. I think a question from Ross. And if anybody else has questions, can you just make yourself visible? Um, it'll be, we've only got a few minutes left, but as it happens, it was on this day a few years back that a group in Lee's town conceived a nation dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. I think they weren't being gender specific either, but everyone's created equal. But now genomics is the ultimate proof that that's not true. So how is that I mean, America was conceived because everyone's equal, then equality of opportunity is the thing that matters, whereas in the old world, people aren't equal, and so therefore outcomes are different and equality of outcomes becomes your aim. And we now have either genomics is un-American or America is unscientific and not evidence-based. That's easy. <laughs> <laughs> two, two minutes. <laughs> Or less. No, no oh or less. Look at the <laughs> Should we just have a yes no from the panel? Would that, that help? Is that an Australian trying to provoke a war between Britain and America? Uh, Ross. I, I think we're going to have to do that later, Ross, because that's really complicated. Unless anyone wants to uh, summarise that one. No, right, moving on. Uh, where's, who's got the next microphone? Can we pass the microphone? Uh, there's a question. Oh, one over there first, sorry. Sorry, sir. Great Western Hospital, Swindon. Um, just comment about uh, the increased population of elderly. Um, and because of advanced medical care, I think on the other side, sir, there are somebody paying the bill. Younger people can't go on the property ladder, younger people can't afford having children, even if they have children, they can't educate them because of the increased fee, so you know, there is uh, somebody else on the other side paying the price of this advanced medical care on the elderly side, that's a comment. Okay. Did the panel want to address true, that? It's true, but that's a terrible note to end on. That is a okay. product yeah. of extraordinary increases in life expectancy over the last 50 years. It, so it, it's a difficult problem to deal with, and we're all going to have to deal with it as we go older, but, it, but it's, a, it's a kind of wonderful thing that people now live 20 years after their retirement. We've got to work out the transfers of wealth so that, so that young can progress and enjoy the lives that we have and people uh, you know, before us, but, but it's, a, the res, it's a result of a great thing. I, I, would, I, I want to try to end on a... Healthcare is a phenomenally interesting industry. Let's just be realistic. It's a three and a half trillion dollar industry in the states, and um, I think worldwide we're seeing the growth of this this industry. Industries have historically gone through transformative um, times through our lifetime. We've seen it in the airline industry. We've seen it in the trucking industry. We've seen this story before. We're in the middle of a phenomenal time to be in healthcare. And I would say it's an exciting and phenomenal time to be in healthcare, but it's transformative. And we're going to have to sort through all of those realities. Um, but it is a transformative, exciting time to be in the industry of healthcare. And that's how I'd like to... Yeah, and I think the genomics and the artificial intelligence and all those things can make sure we're operating on the right people with the best outcomes. Um, you know, we can make sure we're doing the right thing for... The people to have the longest quality of life. And I think, I think long-term survival in the USA has gone down for the second year running, has it? So you're doing your bit to... <laughs> Ross! <laughs> Ross. <laughs> Can we take one last question over here, please? Thank you. I, I think any, if anyone doubts that disruption is going to be the big change that, positively in medicine, you, you have to listen to Tony Sieber from Stanford talk about disruption in transport... And, and, and start coming up with hard figures about what it's going to do to Los Angeles with freeing up a parking space, 80% reduction in vehicles on the roads within 12 years. And I think disruption is definitely going to be what saves medicine going forward. Thank you. Well, lots of nodding. That's a good uh, yeah. <laughs> Just for the panel, I think, to, uh, to finish up if we can. Put yourself forward 10 years, it's the 80th birthday. You as an individual, what one difference would you make as a panel member 
to population health going forward? What would you like to see done? Globally? It doesn't matter. It can be globally or locally. Of course. I'm yeah, so each of you. Uh, we've done something meaningful about climate change. Carol? I think the use of big data to better understand outcomes and segment the population to where we best use different resources. So, um, Can I say me too? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I, th- I think we're going to need to um, understand what we know in a more elegant way and apply it um, rather than continuously just looking for you know, new um, novel, innovative things. I think, we, I think we need to sort of pause and really comb through what we already understand and use that to its um, most effective state. Bruce, you've done a lot already, but yeah. just a bit more. I think I'd want to focus on prevention. Prevention, yeah. thank you. Remini? Uh, so climate change, but in healthcare, I would say focusing on outcomes that are important to patients, not doctors. Yeah. Uh, sorting out our own behaviour. So we're reverse evolving at the moment. We're getting more and more inactive, and actually somehow it's a huge challenge, but sorting out our own behaviour. Mike, thank you. (laughs) I'd just like to put our hands together to thank our panel and our speakers. (laughs) Just to say thank you to all of you and to wish you a long and sunny evening with something cold to drink. So we'll see you all again tomorrow. Thank you, please. So don't forget the full lecture from Sir Bruce Keogh, Ernest Henry Starling Plenary Lecture 2018. 70 years on, our NHS is available in full on the Top Med Talk website. And we've put this out as a little teaser in case you missed it. It was an absolutely excellent piece uh, from, like I say, Sir Bruce Keogh. Don't forget, of course, if you want to meet the Top Med Talk team, all you need to do is get onto the website, ebpom.org. And once you're on that website, click on the section marked Meetings. Also, of course, don't forget to check out our website, topmedtalk.com, and connect with us on all of the social media platforms we operate on, including LinkedIn, Twitter, Facebook. We've got a YouTube channel. We look forward to speaking to you soon. Top Med Talk. Top Med Talk.